Hi, welcome to Pro Live Streaming from Cameras to Encoders. My name is Alden Fertig from IBM Cloud Video. I'm Photo Joseph from Photo Joseph Studios and YouTube.com slash Photo Joseph. So today we're going to talk about the gear and the techniques that you need to create great looking live streams. And we have a couple partners that have sponsored us with some of the gear for this presentation today. Panasonic, we're going to be using the Panasonic Lumix GH5. So that's the image you see right now. And we're going to talk about using that for live streaming. And also Epifan, we're streaming this right now using the Epifan Pearl 2 encoder. So we're going to talk about specific gear, but we're also going to talk about the techniques that you can use. And while we're using specific gear, and we're going to talk a lot about makes and models and what we like to use, uh, you know, we'd like to also always remind people that use what you have and, and see what works. And, you know, and a lot of the techniques we're going to talk about are not specific to these makes and models. So we're going to talk about why we like this gear and why we're using it, because it works. But on the other hand, we'll also hopefully teach you some new things that even if you have different makes and models lying around, uh, I'm sure you'll learn something new today. So thanks for joining us. Absolutely. It's important to recognize that you don't need to have really, really high end gear just to go live, but you do need to have proper gear to go live at a really high caliber, really high quality. But the good news is you can start with very little and really build up from there. Yeah, and one of the things we'll talk about, we're going to kind of go in signal flow order, okay? So we're going to start with cameras. We're going to talk about cameras, audio. We're going to talk about switching and mixing it all together. And then we're going to talk about using an encoder to stream it. And we're going to show you some different setups. And we're going to talk about, like you said, you can build your way up to it. And, and, and you have a lot of experience doing live streaming. You're doing a daily live streaming show. That's right. And you're going to talk about sort of your experience of how you got to where, where you are and why you're using the gear you are today. So, Absolutely. Great. So let's, let's start with cameras because, okay. you know, um, so let's just assume as a baseline, uh, you know, you've created a nice looking shot. Um, one thing we have here is we have a nice plain background. Hopefully you see that. And, uh, you know, uh, if you have a nice looking shot and you have some decent lighting, you need to have a great camera to capture that. One thing before we jump into the cameras, I just want to remind our audience that please ask questions. Uh, there's a question and answer module. You can type your question in there. We already have a couple before we got started, so we'll address those throughout. And at the end, we'll, we'll get to some more. So uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your questions and uh, help you out with your particular situation if we can. And um, let's, let's jump into the camera. So uh, let's talk about using the Panasonic Lumix GH5, because Certainly. that's what we're using today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have three of these up here right now. We're using three cameras. We've got a wide shot and then two close-up cameras. And there are a lot of advantages to using the Lumix camera for something like this. One of the biggest things that you'll find on pretty much any camera that you look at, the first thing you have to look at, whether it's a Lumix or any other manufacturer, you've got to look at the HDMI out and make sure that it's something we call clean HDMI out. And by clean HDMI out, what we mean is you're not only getting a full resolution stream at full frame rate, but you're getting it without any image overlays, without any, any graphics on there telling you what's going on with the camera, telling you what your exposure is. You need to have that clean signal just as if you were recording it internally on the camera. And that is something that all the Lumix cameras do. And so that right there just sets them apart. Not all cameras do that, but it's a really important thing to have that capability to do that. This is a big question we get all the time. One of the most common questions we get after what camera should I use is, can I use my DSLR for mm -hmm. live streaming? And the answer to that a lot of times is a maybe, and a lot of times it depends on that clean output. Right, it depends on the clean output. And another thing that'll happen, especially on mirrored cameras, mirrored cameras aren't designed to have their sensors active all the time. Right, so if you're shooting video on a mirrored camera, the mirror happens to flip up out of the way, and then the sensor is recording the signal and recording it to video or outputting it over the HDMI. But those are generally designed to have a 30 minute limit. It's actually 29 minute, 29 second limit. And it's, the reasoning behind it has to do with taxes and import duties, it's a whole weird thing. But point is, a lot of cameras have that 29, 29 limit. And if you have a mirrorless camera, even if it has the 29, 29 limit, if you're not in recording internally, that's probably okay because you're still getting the HDMI out and that's what really matters. But on a mirrored camera, you hit that limit and the mirror flips down, you've just lost your picture. So that's kind of not acceptable to have your picture suddenly go dark in the middle of your show. So that's a really important thing to look at to make sure that you're not only getting clean HDMI out, but you're getting an image coming out that's going to keep going out even after 30 minutes. So uh, that's, that's another important point, which is that there's a big difference between, say, um, you know, a still camera or a video camera. And one of the things that video cameras were designed to do is be able to sort of keep them on all the time right. and keep them running all the time. Right. Whereas a lot of these still cameras that then were people started to shoot video on them, they couldn't run for a long amount of time. Right. But one of the reasons why we like using this Panasonic GH5 for streaming is because it has uh, not just the clean output, but also uh, from a power situation, you can run it for a long period of time, correct? Right, absolutely. You can run it 
off of batteries, obviously, you've got an internal battery. We even have, oh, I forgot to grab it, we have a, a battery grip that goes on the bottom so you can add a secondary battery so you can go even longer. But if you're going to do something like we have here, all these cameras are hooked up to AC adapters. And those are something you can even buy third party, they're really inexpensive, and then you never have to worry about it. And you honestly don't ever even have to turn the camera off. You can just leave it on all the time and it'll keep it powered up and off you go. You don't have to worry about the power problem. Okay, and then uh, what else in terms of, you know, you've used these extensively, sure. so um, that's part of what you do is you, you shoot on these out in the field, you use these in the studio. What else do you like about the GH5? For yeah, streaming? absolutely. So it's important to recognize that on the Lumix cameras, almost every model, I think actually every current model is capable of doing 4K. So if you want to do 4K, you can do that. Um, you can get the 4K out on the HDMI on most of them. But what really starts to set it apart when you go up to the bigger cameras are things like uh, when you switch over to shutter angle mode on here instead of the shutter speed. With the shutter angle, you can vary the shutter angle very slightly in one degree increments, which allows you to remove the flicker that you often get when you're shooting under artificial lights. Now here we're shooting with LED lights, so it's probably not a problem. Some LED lights are still can have a tendency to flicker. But if you're shooting under fluorescence or just normal tungsten lighting, that cycle, that if you're in the U.S., that 60 hertz cycle is going to introduce a flicker. So you have to change the cut of the shutter angle from 180 degrees down to 178 degrees to get rid of it. And you can't do that on most cameras, but that's something you can do on the GH5. So that's that's a really important differentiation right there. Uh, does that does that fix at all shooting a computer screen? Can you yeah, get rid absolutely. of the flicker on that? Yeah, as well? and you might have to have to find a different cycle for that. Okay. Uh, you point it at an LCD monitor or at a, a CRT monitor even, and you'll see it. You can see that rolling screen, but then you just go in your shutter angle and you just dial it until it gets in sync and then that flicker goes away. I've even done things where I'm shooting a little uh, LED display on a, on a product, on a camera, on whatever, just some little LED display and it's flickering like crazy but you adjust that shutter angle and boom, you can get rid of it completely. Great. Yeah. Um, so what else, um, let's talk a little bit about lenses. So one yeah. of the things that, um, you know, I think a reason why people want to use something like a, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera is because you get superior image quality. Right. Part of that superior image quality is that you can have these interchangeable lenses. Sure. So what do you recommend for lenses for doing, you know, I know most photographers seem obsessed with lenses and you can spend everything from $200 to $20,000 Yeah, you really lens. can. And so what, you know, if, if, we're, if we're looking at, you know, we don't have 20,000 to spend on a single lens, we're not shooting a movie here, but we do want a nice looking live stream, what would you yeah. recommend for lenses? So as, as with everything in this answer, there, there's never any one right answer that's for everybody. But as much as we can generalize it, some of the things to look out for, when you're looking at lenses, you've got your fixed focal length lenses, non-zoom lenses, and then your zoom lenses. And so there's just two separations right there. And when you're shooting video, it's certainly a lot easier to have a zoom lens. That gives you a lot more flexibility. You don't have to move the camera just to change the shot a little bit. So that's a lot easier. But when you're shooting with zoom lenses, to get a really good high quality zoom lens, you are going to spend more money. So and one of the things that makes it a higher quality, makes it more ideal for video, is a fixed aperture. So if you've got a lens that has a variable aperture where the aperture changes from wide open to, uh, from zoomed out to zoomed in, then that changes the exposure on your shot. And if you're in a studio type situation, you want to be able to just zoom into your subject. If the exposure changes, then you have to compensate some other way. You have to either change the aperture or uh, change the, the shutter speed, which you really don't want to do in video. So you might be changing the ISO on the fly. And you can automate that, but in general, you don't want those things to be changing while you're shooting. So a lens that's got a fixed aperture is generally going to be better if you're doing video, especially if you're doing live. Yeah, and the, the zoom point is pretty important because I think, you know, if, if you're setting up a shoot, again, you know, and you have the only purpose of your shoot is to create an awesome image, then you can put your cameras wherever you want. But a lot of times when we're doing live streaming, you know, we might need to shoot something that is a real life event. And so someone might say, hey, you have to put your camera further back in the sure. back of the room. And so you need a zoom lens. You so, need that longer lens. So yeah. fixed aperture zooms. And then yeah. finally, uh, what, else, what else do we have on the GH5? Well, another thing, to, just on lenses before we yep. go off of that, when, when you're talking about photography, still photography, everybody's obsessed with bokeh, that shallow depth of field, that blurry background, and it's gorgeous. And if you're doing something very, very cinemagraphic, you want something that looks like film, then you want that. You want that shallow depth of field. If you're shooting video and you have the opportunity to do multiple takes, in case you miss the focus point, you can reshoot it. That's great, you shoot with those kind of lenses. But when you're shooting live, you don't have a second chance. And if focus is missed, it's gone. It's already out there, the world's already seen it, so there's nothing you can do about it. So you generally don't want to have that super shallow depth of field. You can certainly buy lenses that will give you that really shallow depth of field. Uh, some zoom, but more on the, on the fixed focal length lenses. But they're, while they're great for portraits, if, you're, if your subject is going to be really locked in, they're not moving, that can be okay. But if people are doing this a little bit, you don't want them going out of focus. So focusing, no pun intended, on that really shallow depth of field is not necessarily the best thing to look at for video. So it's just one of those things to, to consider when you're doing live. 
And then the final thing I think that uh, we're going to talk about in terms of the Panasonic GH5 is the audio connections. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll transition and talk a little bit more about audio. But um, one thing that, you know, a lot of people ask us, so a common question we get, like I said, some people say, what camera should I use? Some people say, can I use a DSLR? And then the third one we get is, I have an XYZ, can I use it? Sure. And, and you know, one of the things that we kind of look for, there's a couple of key things that we look for, which the Panasonic GH5 has all of them, which is why we like it. But, but you know, clean HDMI output, um, long run times, being able to plug it in, um, you know, simple stuff like being able to mount it on a tripod, but most cameras, you can do that now sure. at this point. But one thing that sometimes you have to spend a little bit more money for is to get a professional audio connection. Right. So some of the cheaper cameras have like a mini jack, which looks like your headphone jack, um, but the GH5 has a little audio thing where you can get full XLR inputs right. and proper trim and phantom power and things like that. Yeah, it's called the XLR1, and the XLR1 allows you to plug in two XLR microphones. And XLR, of course, is balanced audio. It's a professional quality. You can do really long cable runs on XLR. And that allows you to feed that directly into the camera. And as we get into the more audio section, I know we're talking about alternate ways to route your audio, but routing it through the camera is definitely one of the easiest ways. And you mentioned that, so the GH5, we have the XLR one. We have that adapter. It also has the mini jack in. But a lot of cameras don't have a microphone input at all. And so you don't even have that option. So that's something really to consider. If someone's asking, can I use this camera that I have? If it doesn't have a microphone input, then you can't, at least with, not without routing the audio through a mixer and into your streaming hardware separately. And one other consideration when considering what kind of gear you should buy is, is thinking about, okay, am I trying to create a studio setup that's fixed, or mm -hmm. am I trying to create a kit that I can bring on the road? Right. And so um, when it comes to a camera, you may not be able to afford two sets of cameras. You might need to buy sure. one camera that can do double duty. And so even if in the studio we could route the audio through a mixer and you don't need that connection, maybe when you go out in the field, you do want to be able to route the audio directly into the camera. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So there's yeah. some flexibility that you get there, and, and you can detach that piece or not, depending on whether or not you need it. So the cameras we have set up here, they don't have that audio connection on the top because we didn't need it. Um, but maybe if we bring the same camera out in the field, we plug that in and plug our microphone into it. Right. And the great advantage of, of using something like the XLR1 on there is you get dual mics in. So let's say we're doing an interview of us out in the field. We're both on mics that are professional level mics. They're wired. We've got XLR cables going in. We can feed them into the camera and we can record them to two separate channels, to left and right channels. So that way we have, for later use, we have that separated channel. So if someone wants to mix it or if one of us coughs, for example, the editor can drop that out and it's on a separate channel. And that's really handy as well. So let's talk about, um, you know, what are some options for audio? And we'll start again. We, we'll talk about both gear and techniques. So there's three different ways that you might want to mic. Uh, maybe there's more than three, but these are three popular ones sure. uh, that, that a lot of people use. So one would be something like a tabletop microphone. And here we have the Heil PR40, which is something that you've used. Right. Um, second would be a shotgun microphone. And a shotgun microphone are most typically used when you want to have the microphone out of the shot. Um, so this is what's used commonly for uh, filming where someone is holding it above above the head. Right. Um, and then final is, is, is a lavalier, which are probably one of the more popular ways. It's what we're wearing here today. Um, and we'll talk about how you can maybe um, hide those a little bit. So, so the one that you see on the screen here um, is a is a flesh-colored lavalier because it's one that's actually designed to be to be hidden more. Right. Um, whereas we're using uh, black-colored ones today that kind of blend in with our shirts. Um, but depending on what sort of wardrobe your subject is wearing, maybe you, you can or can't clip it on the shirt, or maybe you want to hide it. Um, so talk a little bit about your experience using these and what have you found works for, say, a live streaming situation. Sure. So I use all three of these microphones, these types of mics, just depending on what I'm doing. Now, the Heil PR40, that's a tabletop mic. So that's something that's designed for someone who's sitting at a desk, they're sitting in front of a microphone, and they're not moving. So if you're, if you're not going to move away from your location and you don't mind having a microphone in the shot, then that's going to be a really, really good option. The sound quality coming out of that microphone is fantastic. You get a really good, what we call a radio voice. You get that really good, deep oh, voice that just sounds fantastic. It's very good at isolating the area that you're in and not picking up back background noise. But as soon as you get just a little bit away from it, the levels drop dramatically. So you can't be moving around and doing it. Plus, the other problem with it is if you want to do something with your hands, if you're doing a product demo, for example, it's in the way and you can't. So the only time that I use that is if I'm doing an audio only podcast or if I'm doing any kind of a video show or interview where I don't need my hands to do stuff. Maybe, you know, sure I can reach over my laptop or something, but I'm not doing any kind of product demo. So it sounds the best, but it's the least convenient for a lot of use cases. 
The shotgun mic, like you said, it's it's out of the shot. It's not visible. Um, but to really get good use of it, you if someone's moving, you got to have someone moving the mic around. And it's a boom operator having someone moving that around, and clearly that's not something that's in most people's budgets to have for a regular live show. If your subjects aren't moving, if you've got a couple people at a table, you can put up a couple of these shotgun mics and position them just right. But again, you have a limited amount that you can move before they go in and out of sound on there. So it may not be ideal. And then the lavalier, like you said, that's by far the most convenient. Especially if you've got a wireless lav, you can put it on your subject. They're mic'd in. They have freedom to move. It doesn't matter where they go. This, the distance between their mouth and the microphone barely changes. As they go up and down, it might change a little bit, but it's pretty minimal, and the mics are really good at compensating for that. And then you have that convenience, but it's, it's probably the least good sounding of the three. Uh, now, this can still sound fantastic, and if you route them into a mixer that has an equalizer on it, you can compensate for some of that, add a little more bass, that sort of thing, but, uh, but it is the lowest end of the mics when it comes to that. And one thing that we did here, um, you know, just talking about our own experience, was that we were using some wireless labs up until right. a few days ago, and we're actually using wired labs right now because we switched our studio and we started to hear some interference. And uh, we can probably mess around with the channels more and solve that eventually, um, but wired labs can also be a way that, you know, we weren't really happy with the sound we are getting off the wireless. It's, it was pretty unpredictable. You could be talking for 20 minutes and it's fine, and all of a sudden you hear a little bzz, bzz, yeah. which was just really, you know, sort of distracting. So, yeah. so we, we decided to go wired lab. So we're actually using an Audio Technica wired uh, lavalier microphone today. Right. So. And you can buy wireless packs for as little as maybe $150 up to a couple thousand dollars per pack, per pair. And that's, that gets expensive very quickly. And those higher end ones have greater range, better interference blocking, more channels to switch between, or even channel hopping if they detect interference. But you've got to pay a lot of money for that. Uh, so yeah, to get something really, really good that's wireless, you're spending coin. So we'll talk about another really tricky uh, thing that comes to audio, and that's sort of how you get perfect lip synchronization. <laughs> and so there's two sort of ways yeah. that we could um, you know, decide to route our audio. One would be we route it through the camera. And right. the advantage on this is that usually you don't have audio synchronization issues. Right. If, if, let's say, we were using a single camera, a single microphone, we route it through the camera, and then routed it into our encoder or switcher or mixer or whatever. So this is a pretty safe way to make mm -hmm. sure that you don't have audio syncage. However, this isn't really always the most convenient routing. So the, um, the setup we're using, for example, today is we're routing the audio uh, through a mixer. Right. Um, that's not really the microphone we're using. We're using lavaliers. We're using a different mixer. That's the mixer you use. That's right. Um, but um, in this situation, sometimes what you need to do is you need to delay uh, the audio uh, so that it's synchronized with the video. Right. Um, and so we'll show you on two different types of encoders. We're using the Epiphan Pearl 2 today. That's on the right-hand side. And that's a little screenshot in the settings of where you can do the audio delay. And this can be really useful because uh, a lot of times, most common thing is that the audio gets ahead of the video because um, audio doesn't require a lot of processing. Right. Usually video requires some processing. And so by the time it goes through your switcher, by the time you composite your shots, it's delayed by some frames or some milliseconds. Um, on the left-hand side is Ustream Producer Pro. It's also the same in Telestream Wirecast. You see there's a little delay function at the bottom of the audio channel. And so um, you actually taught us something yesterday when we were doing the rehearsal, which was awesome, which was, you know, a lot of times when you do an audio sync test, it kind of looks like this, and I'm looking directly into the camera, and someone makes me talk for like 10 minutes, and I have to like articulate my words very carefully, <laughs> or we sit here and we have someone clap for like ever. Um, so you showed us a really cool thing, which I'll pull up here on this iPad, which is um, on YouTube, you can just go find this, this one's called Home Theater Audio Video Sync. There's a bunch of different ones. Yeah. Um, and what this does is it plays uh, a tone and it has a little graphic that kind of shows you whether or not it's, it's in sync. And right. so, so how do, you, how do you use this? So yeah, so this is, what's playing off the iPad right now is in sync. Whenever that line that's spinning hits the zero mark, it beeps. When you record this, you can now look at the video and look at the audio waveform on your recording, and you can look, of course, at the frame where that black line lined up with the zero, and the beep, the peak in the audio where that is, and see how far they're off. And you can very easily look at it and go, oh, look, I'm three frames off, adjust and go. And yeah, so, so, simple. so when we did this yesterday, for example, how it, how it worked out was, like you said, on the iPad, it's going to, you know, when we watch it here, it's perfectly in sync. But then, basically, when we watched it through, coming through on the stream, 
you would hear the beep when the visual was like up here. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we adjusted that setting on our Epifan Pearl 2 yeah. and got it perfectly in sync. Right, and this display on one side, it shows how many frames it's off, but it's, it is set for 24 frame per second delay or um, playback. But here you have a millisecond readout. And that on the Pearl 2 is what we have is a millisecond adjustment, actually on the uh, Ustream producer as well. And so you can just look at it here. It says, oh, it's 125 off. So you punch that number in, and, and you're good to go. And, and I mean, this was, this was seriously a game changer for us. Because nice. I can't tell you, uh, you know, how often we've struggled with this. And it's, and it's uh, pretty close to accurate because, um, you know, we, are, we saw that it was hitting around this 125. And so we dialed it in about mm -hmm. that, that same amount, and it was remarkably close. Because awesome. that's the other thing is, it's, it's one of the trickiest and most frustrating problems in any, any of our audience who's, who's done this sort of work, whether it's live or recorded, you'll know how tricky it can be because if you're just trying to do it visually, you're like, I think it's in, no, I think yeah. it's not. Uh, is, it, is it ahead, is it behind? So two things that, that can really help is one is almost always the audio is ahead so that at least gets right. you in the right direction, the right space. Um, but using this was really cool for us because we were able to kind yeah. of uh, dial in a little more precisely than we have in the past. Awesome. So I'm going to check, um, why, don't we, why don't we see before we go into the next piece, because we're going to get really more complicated in okay. a minute here. Yeah, we are. So let's see if we have any, let's see if we have any good, um, uh, good questions and comments. I uh, appreciate, by the way, all the participation from the audience. So um, if you have a question or a comment, please look at the Q&A module. You can enter it there, and I'll read a couple of them now. So... Um, uh, from uh, Michael or Michelle, I don't know which one that is. Um, Sankin COS 11D is also an excellent choice. So really funny, uh, we had a different version of this slide that had uh, the Sankin COS 11D on the right hand <laughs> side there. Um, so that's a different um, alternate uh, lavalier model. Um, we also use the uh, Sennheiser EW100 G3, right, which I think it. are the same ones you that's use. That's what I have, yeah. Uh, very popular choice. Um, we just sh showed this DPA one because it's kind of a cool, you know, this was supposed to be an advanced live streaming thing, right. so we want to show some really advanced stuff, and these are like, if you get crazy with hiding them. So and that's how, something that I have. How have yeah. your results been with, with hiding the mics? Because you yeah, said it's something that you've actually tough. done a lot. Yeah, yeah. It, it can get really difficult. The, the cha well, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, first is actually keeping it invisible. So it's not poking out from somewhere. But as soon as it goes behind something, whether it's behind a collar, behind the placard on your shirt, um, behind a scarf, Whatever it is, it's now there's another barrier between your voice and the microphone, so you're muffling the sound. Now, mics like the DPA that's on there are actually designed for that. The, the, the condenser, the part, there's a part on the mic that is really designed for that. It's expecting there to be a muffled frequency coming in, so it compensates for that. So that helps right away. But then as far as where you position it, you have to worry about clothing noise. Is it going to move while, the, while your subject is moving around? Are you going to hear clothing rustle while it's moving around, the clothing rubbing up against it? Any number of things can go wrong with it. It can be really hard to get a position just right. And fortunately, there's a lot of really good YouTube videos, and I've watched a ton of them, giving advice on how to hide them, where to hide them, and how to position them so they don't fall down. And a lot of things require nothing more than some tape that you just fold over. There's a little triangle shape you can make with gaffer's tape that is a fantastic tool to really hold that microphone in place. Put a couple of those as kind of sandwiches, put the mic between them, have the head just sticking out of the sticky part, put that behind the shirt and stop, slap it down. And that works remarkably well. But again, even there, if it's here and I go this way towards the camera, suddenly you can see it, that might not be acceptable. It depends on what you're doing. If you're in an interview, maybe it's okay. But if you're on a movie set, well, you can't have your mic showing up. That's not okay. So, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated thing to get right. It takes a lot of effort for sure. Yeah, we were working on a live show, and I watched the audio guy there. It was, it was the first time I had seen these in use, and what he did was he, he taped them to people's, you know, skin, actually. Right. And, you know, it was it was a slightly awkward conversation because he had explained to every person, like, hey, I'm going to tape this to you. But, right. you know, it was it worked surprisingly well. And, and I think part of the reason why he did it was because he wasn't sure what people were going to be wearing. Mm -hmm. And the situation there was that we had, like, maybe 60 people walking onto the set, oh, and wow. he had to mic them up within, you know, like 30 seconds. Whoa. And so <laughs> he didn't want to, like, have to deal with, okay, maybe someone's going to come up wearing something weird, so he just, he just with everyone he knew, he could tape it on, which was really right. interesting. And they, and they sounded great. So. Right. All right, so a few more, uh, few more comments. Um, so um, webinar looks great. What kind of lighting are you using? So we're using uh, Kino Flows here as well as the... Uh, some LEDs in addition. We're lighting the background separate from us. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have any recommendations for lighting? What, what, do, you, what do you think? What do you use? Or? Well, there's, over the last couple of years, there have been some really nice breakthroughs in LED technology. And fortunately, it's gotten a lot cheaper to get really good LEDs. It used to be that you had to spend a huge amount of money to get good LED lighting. And LEDs usually just weren't that bright. 
you could buy things like the Kino Flows, which are not inexpensive, or even bigger lights that would give you an immense amount of light, but you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars. These days, you can go into Amazon, go into B&H, and just search LED lights, and you can find a lot of really decent options. The thing is that you have to watch out for is a lot of the lower quality ones may not have very good color accuracy. They don't have a good, what we call a CRI, color rendering index, and if it's, not a, if it's not a very high CRI, it just doesn't look good. There's something wrong with the light that you're looking at. On cheap LEDs, you can get something called a green spike, which you won't see on the picture until you go to color grade it, and then you see this weird thing on the green channel. Where did that come from? It's something out of the, out of the lights that was just there. So there's a lot of things to look out for like that, but the good news is that you can go relatively cheap these days. Uh, I just bought a new set of lights from B&H. They're only a couple hundred bucks a piece, and they're, they put out a lot of light. They're really nice quality, and I'm loving them. It's, there's, there's some good options out there. And, and two, two tips, you know, again, like good lights can be very expensive, like you said, but two tips that we've, we've found. One is um, diffusion is really key. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, even if you have bad lights, the difference between diffusion and no diffusion can be yep. night and day. Yep. The second thing is someone asked here, they said, they said, what about if I, you know, I have no control over the, the lighting? So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have to, and, and this is where I would say our experience has been a, a good camera can make a huge difference. Sure. Because a bad camera will require a lot of light and, and or if you start to uh, adjust it up to, to uh, compensate the low light, light, you start to get a really grainy image. Right. So um, a good camera can make a really big difference yeah, in a low light situation. Yeah, having good low light performance is, is huge if you don't have any control over it. But even if you're in an environment where you can't control it, can you really not control it at all? Maybe there's a light you can turn on or off. I've done things in hotel rooms where we're literally pulling every table lamp, every desk lamp together, going to the rooms next door and grabbing more lights out of them and just building a wall of light using just crappy hotel lighting. You gotta do what you gotta do. There's, there's always a way to modify something rotate your subject, you can find a way, you work with what you've got. Uh, you can't walk into a situation and say, well, I have no control, so off I go. You gotta find a way to control it at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, someone asked, what's the uh, setup we're using? And I think before we go into your setup, we'll just mention that one uh, uh, yeah. quickly. Um, so what we're using here is we're using the Panasonic Lumix GH5s. We're using three of them. Uh, so we have a wide shot, and then we have a close up of each of us. Um, we're using, uh, those uh, go into the Epifan Pearl 2, and we're gonna show that a little bit later. And we're using the Epifan Pearl 2 to both do the compositing and the switching of the shots and the encoding. Okay. And we're using a Mackie mixer for the audio. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is a relatively simple setup. I didn't say it was cheap. Some people got really <laughs> mad at me when they, they're like, oh, of course it looks great, you're spending thousands of dollars. But, you know, um, I think you and I both had a similar experience that, you know, when we started out, we weren't spending thousands of dollars. Right. Maybe we were spending hundreds. And over time, you learn what you need. So um, we have a schematic of, of your studio. So we're going we're gonna to go take a look at that, and we're going to talk about what you use. Okay. So uh, let me just pull it up here, and we can, we can zoom into it. And, um, you know, and also, I want you to kind of talk about, you know, why, why you ended up settling on, on the gear that you have. Right, so, absolutely. So why don't you talk to us about kind of what you're using for, and just to, just to set up the stage. So you're doing a daily live show, mm -hmm. um, and you're doing a lot of product demos. Right. Um, it's mostly a, a one-man show, though. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and you, have, you, have, you have an assistant who helps you with some of the switching and stuff, but it's one man both in the sense of you're the only person that's usually on the camera, and you set it up so you can control a lot of it yourself. Right. I do all the switching myself. All of that is controlled from my place. The, my assistant, Ryan, he's, he's kind of a back-end producer on this, and what he'll do at the beginning of the show is take me live, and then at the end of the show, he'll roll a closing graphic over me. Instead of me activating that, he rolls that. And, uh, and then he also monitors the comments. So, like right now, we've got a live comment show, but nobody, we're not seeing the comments live on our display. Mm -hmm. On the way I have my show set up, we'll see those live comments. And so if someone's getting ugly or someone's being insulting or just rude or whatever, you don't necessarily want that on screen. And so he's there to knock them off, mute them, kick mm -hmm. them out if needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a guy who used to, he called it the band hammer. He, liked it. he was the guy who rocked the band hammer. There you go. Um, all right, so, so why don't you walk us through yeah. where we're, I don't know where you want to start on this diagram. Well, should but we start with where, where I tried to start before I went this crazy? Sure, I think yeah. It's, I think it's yeah. good to start a little bit of history here. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing live streaming of one sort or another going all the way back to 2009, which is kind of insane. And they didn't even call it live streaming then. It was just webinars and things like that. And I was actually using 
uh, Citrix go to webinar for a while. It was a great service for this. And the whole thing I was doing was software training. I did this thing that I still do today, call it live training. And you could watch me training on a piece of software. Back then it was just all about Aperture, Apple's Aperture product. That's what I was doing training on. And you could watch live for free. And then if you couldn't watch the live one, you could buy the video later. But if you watch live, you got it for free. And I got to have the whole audience interaction. But at that point, all it was was my computer screen, so my Aperture screen being displayed. And if I wanted to get me on screen, the kind of workaround that I had was I would bring up an app like Photo Booth on my Mac, and that would show me, and so I could talk to my audience. And the sync was definitely not there, and it's low quality, and it's probably five frames per second or something horrible. But hey, it was there. It was me. You could see me, and it was nice to have that audience interaction as opposed to just a computer screen and a disembodied voice. And at some point, I don't know, let's say three years ago or so, I decided that it was time to really up the game on this. And I'd gone through a lot of iterations, better lighting, slightly better webcams, but really not taking it to that whole next level. And I decided that I was going to do this, and I was going to try and do it cheap. So I figured, you know, I can do this for a couple thousand dollars. I'm a smart guy. I can make this work. It wasn't that easy. <laughs> I tried to do it all in software. And using something like Wirecast, it's a phenomenal tool that allows you to bring in multiple camera angles, mix them, do split screens, do overlays, picture in picture, graphics, all this stuff. But you run into a couple of limitations. There's, first of all, you've got a finite amount of CPU power, how much the computer can handle. And when you're having the computer take all the streams coming in, do all the overlays, do all the switching, and do the encoding and output, you're hitting a limit of that CPU, no matter what computer you're using, pretty quickly. Also, you've got bandwidth limitations of how many cameras you can feed into the computer. If you're using HDMI cameras and you want to feed them in over a USB converter, well, USB, even USB 3, has a limited bandwidth. And no matter, you pl start plugging in devices, that bandwidth isn't per device. It's for the whole bus. And so you're going to pretty quickly run out of space there. So eventually, I, I tried this stuff, and it was, it was kind of working, but not super reliable. And eventually, I said, you know what? I've just got to go hardware. I talked to some friends in the industry who said, yeah, quit screwing around with the software. It's time for you to go hardware. So I had to spend some money. Uh, but it has been so worth it in the long run. So I won't go through the whole stage of building up to it, but what you're seeing here, this is the system that I'm using today. And right in the center of it, the hub of it all, is this Blackmagic ATEM. It's called the Production ATEM 2ME. And this is a pretty substantial switcher here that allows, well, I think it's 16 inputs, I think. It's a bunch of SDI inputs and uh, an HDMI input and a bunch of audio XLR inputs and a bunch of different options that really allow me to feed in as many sources as I could possibly want. And I'm not using anywhere near this many. And this particular device gives me something called Super Source, which is an advanced picture in picture. And you can see on the screenshot here, they're showing four sources, four images feeding in with a background. That's the display that's on the ME oh, itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's just a, a, from their website. But that's an idea of what it's capable of doing. So now zoom out a little bit or go up to the top and let's take a look at the actual sources that I'm feeding into it here. So I have three cameras and then a few other additional sources. So I've got, there you see Cam 1, that's a Blackmagic camera. Cam 2 is a GH4, and Cam 3 is another Blackmagic studio camera. And the Cam 1 and the close-up are in my broadcast studio. So anybody who's seen my live show, my Photo Joseph's Photo Moment show, sees that I'm in a controlled room. I've got good lighting in there. It's all set up. And I've got a camera that's locked, the wide shot, if you will, that's always on me. And then I've got a close-up camera. That's the GH4. And that's within reach, so I can literally reach up to it. I can change the zoom on it. I can reposition the camera if needed. And that's so that I can show whatever I'm working with at the time. Then out in my shooting studio, because it's a photography studio, out in the shooting studio, I have the other big Blackmagic camera. And that allows me to, uh, to go out there and do a show out in the big workspace. Now, the reason that I'm using Blackmagics here instead of GH4s or GH5s everywhere, for my situation, I'm running SDI. Now, Right now, if I could replace everything with GH5s, I think that'd be a great option. But when I was setting this up, the GH5 obviously wasn't around. The GH4 was, was good for this, but there were some advantages that I had direct SDI out of those boxes that just made more sense for what I was doing. But right now, if I was to rebuild the whole thing, honestly, and I'm not just saying this because Epifan's sitting right over there, but honestly, if I was going to rebuild this from scratch today, I would do what we're doing here, a bunch of GH5s and the Pearl 2. Because as much as I love the Blackmagic box, it is very complicated to set up. It's very complicated to get it exactly the way that I want it, whereas the Pearl is a very simple drag and drop interface, reposition your windows with a mouse like you've done a million times on your computer, and it just doesn't work that way on the, uh, on the ATEM. It's just different setups, but that's the way I've got it right now. Yeah, so one, um, uh, one question we had actually, someone, uh, someone asked, they said, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Um, someone said, do I, do I need an, an encoder? Um, let me see if I can find where the question was, otherwise I'll just do it from memory. 
We have a lot of questions. I appreciate all the questions, by the way. Oh, here we go. Uh, Michael said, is it necessary to always have an encoder to do a live stream? We have a TriCaster, but it's not, not always practical to use it. For example, mobile. Um, so, you know, this is a really interesting question because, first of all, yes, you do need an encoder because the technical definition of an encoder is it's something that, you know, is taking basically the video signal, turning it into uh, a compressed uh, data stream, and most commonly that's H.264 codec and AAC audio codec. And so, but do you need an encoder like does an encoder have to be some special fancy hardware box? No. So there's different types of encoders. So, for example, um, our mobile app has an encoder built into it. So you can encode on your phone. Um, however, you know, depending on your setup, I think what you described is really interesting because this is kind of a common pattern, which is you might say, well, I try to do everything in one box. It's not working, so I'm going to split it out to four boxes. But now I have too much stuff going on. I want to bring it back into one box. Mm -hmm. And so I think you really have to think about what works for you. So, for example, you know, there is a more portable encoder you have right here, the, right. Uh, the Teradek video. Right, this so, guy. So uh, just before we went live today, you did a, a live stream using, it was totally wireless, right? right. It, was, it was just your Panasonic GH5 with this little encoder on mm -hmm. top. You could have done it with just your phone, I guess, if you wanted sure. to as well. But the quality um, wouldn't be there. Quality wouldn't be right. the same. Um, and then also, you know, um, you mentioned that you were using Wirecast as both an encoder and a switcher. Mm -hmm. And now you're still using Wirecast, but you're using Wirecast just as an encoder. Just the encoder, and right. And as a switcher. So one thing that we find is, you know, it all depends, like, yes, the Teradek video is, you know, this thing is so small, it's so compact, right. it's totally wireless. And so you'd say, well, why would I want to have a switcher this big, an encoder this big, and why would I want to hook up 40 wires if I could just do it all in this tiny box? Well, it all depends on what your situation is. So if you need to do something that's fast and convenient, maybe this is a great choice. Portable. Um, but, you know, also someone else asked a question, and this is very relevant to bring up. They said, um, do you have any tips on making, uh, where was it? Let me see if I can find this one. Um, they said, uh, do you have any way to make wireless more reliable or something like that? Let me see oh. if I can find that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. So, so, you know, we, we saw this question that came in actually right before we started, and we were saying, well, you know, the one problem you run into with wireless is wireless is always, you know, can be a little bit, yeah, it can be a little bit unreliable, you yeah. know. And so, you know, for example, today, I think it's a really relevant thing. You said, okay, I want to do a quick live show to my YouTube followers to tell them to come watch this live. Right. And, you know, I would say that wasn't mission critical, right. you know, in the sense of if for some reason it hadn't worked because the wireless cut out on you, you know, y your life would go on, your followers would forgive you. Sure. And you hadn't really spent a lot of money to do that specific live show. But, you know, we've had clients where they're spending $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 to do a whole big production. And then they say, well, can't we just, you know, bring a bring a 4G stick and stream it like that? It's like, well, <laughs> but, you know, what's, what's the, you know, what's the tolerance for if, if wireless or your 4G connection doesn't work, you know, you have to really think about that. And right. so think about how often are you using your phone and your 4G connection doesn't work. Right. And so if you want something that's really reliable, isn't going to fail, you probably have to go to an Ethernet wired thing. Right. And do you need a separate encoder? Well, it depends because what happens if you're running a bunch of stuff through your switcher and your switcher crashes? Do you want the stream to still be able to run from your encoder? Well, if you have a separate encoder, you can do that. So, you know, there's some considerations in terms of yeah. how complicated you want to get. Yeah, there really are. There's so many different options. And it's, it's crazy to think of just trying to figure out what it is you're going to do and deciding what path to go down because there are so many options. And that's one of the reasons that I currently own several different options. And it's not so much for redundancy and backup because, like you said, my show isn't mission critical. If I don't go live, oh, well, I don't go live. There's always tomorrow. But... I'm, sometimes I'm in the studio, sometimes I'm in the field. I have a lot of different ways to go live. It just depends on what I'm doing, where I'm at, and how I want to do it. And you talked about this guy, so I just rigged this up while you were talking, and this is that Teradek Video Pro, which is an encoder and a streamer. It's all built into one, and this is a really robust little device. It even has Ethernet on the back, so I can go wired if I'm in the studio. It has Wi-Fi built in, or I can connect a 4G modem, as I've just done here. And you can actually set them up so they're redundant to each other. So I can set it up so that if this fails, this is my point one, if that fails, it drops to the Wi-Fi or something like that. So you have options on there. And this, as you've seen here, I've just mounted it to the top of the camera. And this is an overly long HDMI cable for this, but you take a short cable, I plug this into here, and I'm good to go. And part of the reason that I rigged this up, I wanted to show another feature on the GH5 I neglected to mention earlier, 
we have this bracket on here that is an HDMI lock, and it's holding that HDMI cable in. So the HDMI cable, I can still unplug it. So that's there. I can physically unplug that. But this cable, let me just kind of really illustrate this, this cannot come out, hmm. right? This is screwed into the camera. The cable, I'm not putting any tension on this part of the cable right here. So if you've got this somewhere, there's no way this is going to fall out. It's not going to get yanked out. And that's, that's critical. Absolutely critical. You don't want your cable popping out in the middle of the show because someone bumped it or it's just sometimes the HDMI cables are loose, like not acceptable. So that's great on there. So I put a short little cable up to this and now I've got a solution that's totally ready to go. Now I'd still want to put another mic on top of this. I'd rig this up here so I had a good audio. But that solution right there is a totally mobile streaming and that's my encoder, my streaming hardware, everything all built into one. And I can take this into my studio. Got it, since it has HDMI in, I can take the signal from my ATEM pump it into this, and this becomes a totally self-contained uh, self streaming solution if I need it. So it's another way to go. That's great. And, uh, you know, one thing that for anyone who's, you know, been in the world of hooking up lots of cameras into their switchers and things like that, you know, this is a really interesting issue that a lot of people run into, which is that HDMI was sort of meant to be this consumer-grade connection. It used to be everyone always do SDI. Right. Um, on your diagram here, you have a lot of these HDMI to SDI converters. And right. this is a pretty common workflow for a lot of people because SDI can do longer cable runs. Right. Um, and so a lot of times you just run basically a short HDMI cable into your SDI converter. However, um, you know, it's one thing that we also like is simplicity in, in setups. And so if you can take out four S SDI converters and if you could run straight HDMI and if one problem you run into is sometimes you want kind of thick gauge HDMI cables, but that's a great solution on that GH5 that can make a big difference. Right, because, um, for example, we used to do a lot of this too, this HDMI to SDI conversion, um, but uh, with the Epifan Pearl 2 that we're using today, um, it has HDMI input, so we're doing some of it. As just, well as SDI. Yeah, so we're right. using some of it just direct HDMI in. Right, and my ATEM only has one HDMI input. All the other inputs are SDI. Mm -hmm. So I have to bring everything in over SDI. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you can get longer cable runs. The cables are thinner. They're less expensive than big uh, HDMI cables, and, and that can be a convenience as well, especially if you've got some distance. My studio camera is quite far away from the switcher, so that's on a long SDI cable that's running up through the ceiling and over, so it's not in people's way to trip. Let's scroll up to the top, take a look at the other inputs in there. So the three cameras are three of the sources, and then there's a couple of computers and an iOS input. So in the middle there you see the Mac Pro, and above that I'm showing a few different screenshots just to illustrate what I'm using that for. And if you watch my live show, you'll see there's always a, a MacBook Pro sitting in front of me. That's my primary kind of interface to everything. From that computer, I can access the ATEM and I can load graphics onto it. So if I'm, I have a bunch of graphics that are all preloaded, pre ready to go. And if I want to talk about, it's kind of an ad, a house ad, if you will. Oh, let's talk about my GH5 training at gh5training.com. Let's talk about my Linda training at lynda.com. And I'll just throw a graphic on there and talk for a couple minutes about it. And it's, it's my version of an ad that I load up there. So I have access to that ATEM interface from within there. The actual switching I do through an iPad, and we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. I don't do the switching through that interface. I also have access to my audio interface. You had a slide up earlier showing the Behringer XR16, and it's actually down on the bottom here. There's my audio interface, and I'm controlling that via software. And I can control that from an iPad or from a computer. I just do it on the computer. And I don't usually need to touch it during the show. That's pretty much locked and loaded and ready to go. But I have it loaded in case I suddenly need to mute a channel or do something else. The cool thing is that Ryan, my assistant, he's in the other room, and he's got access to the same mixer through his software interface at the same time that I do. And so if he's listening, he goes, oh, there's just this little quiet today. He can raise my levels up or pull it down or you know, whatever. He can make changes. There's a background noise. He can try to isolate it and eliminate it in the EQ. And he can do all that while I'm talking. And I don't even know what's happening. He just takes care of it, which is really slick as well. So let's go back to the top. So the, that computer gets used for those things. And also, that's where I do any software demo. So all the way up, uh, keep going up. Uh, if I'm doing a software demo off the MacBook Pro, that's where that's going to be. So that computer needs to be into the switcher, and of course it is, and that is allowing me to show whatever's on there, on that screen. Then over in the next one from there, you see the chat slash Skype Mac. And so that is, uh, it's just a little uh, Mac Mini. That is my chats window, so I can see what my audience is chatting to me. And instead of looking off to the side of the computer to read the chat, I've got it on a big TV that's right underneath my camera, so it's almost like I'm looking at the camera, and I'm just looking down a little bit, and I can read the chat. And what's really neat about it is I have that on half of the screen. So I've got a big, like, 40-inch LCD TV or something. It takes up half the screen, nice big font, so I can see it clearly. And then I bring that into the switcher as well, and I can do a split screen on the switcher where my chat is on half of the screen and I'm on the other half. So the audience, even the non-live audience, can see that chat. So one of the problems with YouTube, and this is all a YouTube show, is that 
that live chat is not archived. It's not, it doesn't even show up as comments later. It's just gone, poof, once the show is over. So this way, anybody watching the show later can see what people were saying virtually in real time as they were typing it up there and as I put it up on screen. Great. Well, we saved the chats on our platform, so it's a good advantage. Well, that's good. There you go. There you go. There's so, a big advantage right there. Um, yeah. Losing that chat's a real disappointment, i got to yeah. say. <laughs> um, so one thing um, that we get, we get asked about a lot, too, and it's, it, your approach is the same thing that we've done here, which is how do you bring in, like, Skype guests? Right. And, and unfortunately, this is one of those things where, again, you know, I love to say there's a really cheap and easy way to do it, but a lot of times, everyone I talk to, this is how they do it. They have a separate computer. Yep. They run Skype in that computer. They basically take an HDMI out or whatever out of that computer, and you just bring it as another source. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yes, you have to run another computer for it, but this is sort of, it's one of those things we haven't, I haven't found a cheaper solution that you can do it in the same box, right. you know. Yeah. Um, we, use the, we use the new tech TriCaster here sometimes. Yeah. They built a special Skype box which is basically another computer that you run exactly. Skype on exactly. that isn't necessarily any cheaper than running a Mac Mini with, with Skype on it. So Yeah, I think know. that box is supposed to have some other enhancements to make that Skype connection better, cleaner. It, it might have a, some special talkback channel or it has some, some visual corrections or some audio sync stuff, but um, that's the one thing that, um, you know, uh, so we showed the audio sync stuff earlier, um, and that's one thing where you also want to dial in the audio sync, although it can be tricky because sometimes it pops back out again on Skype. But um, that can be one way to make your Skype um, you know, guests look a little bit better. Also, we didn't learn this. I feel really dumb. We didn't learn this until we had been doing it for a while. You can just go into preferences and a little checkbox that says turn off the Skype logo. So if you don't <laughs> want that, then you can just do, that, do yes, that. You can. Yes, you can. And then talk about one thing that really uh, piqued my interest in this mm -hmm. diagram was that decimator sure. and, and what you're doing with bringing a phone. Because this is, and by the way, the new iPhone just added some really cool like screen recording features and sure. stuff. So um, that's great if you're doing some kind of recorded demo and hopefully that'll make for all of us who have been doing software demos like you and me, that'll make our software demos much easier, hopefully. But when you're bringing in live, you have a special converter there that's different than the Blackmagic converters right. you're using. Right, okay, so here's, this goes back to one of the other limitations of the ATEM. Uh, again, as much as I love this box, it does have limitations, and one of them is that you have to, whatever your show is gonna be, whatever size and, and frame rate, so whether you're doing 1080p at 2997 or UHD at 2398, whatever you decide on, Every input coming in has to be exactly that. It can't be off by a frame. It has to be exactly that. There's no built-in scaler. So if you are bringing in a, a source that isn't or can't sync up with that, you have to change that size or frequency outside of the ATEM. And that's what that decimator does. So all of the cameras that you see there in the computer will all sync at 1080p 24. And that's what I've standardized on. And the reason I standardized on that is because when I first built this, the Mac was the center point. This was the most important thing because I'm doing software demos. That has to look the best. Everything else goes after that. And a Mac will sync at 24 hertz, at 30 hertz, or at 60 hertz. Now that is 24p 30p and 60p, not 2997, which is what we think of as NTSC or 5994. It's actually 30 and 60. So the ATEM won't sync to that if you put it at standard NTSC 2997. So it will, though, sync its true 24, and the ATEM will do true 24. All the cameras that I have up there will do true 24, which is another reason in my situation I couldn't use anything less than a GH series Lumix camera because they don't do true 24. They do 2398. But 24 is considered a cinema mode. That's a pro feature. It's only on the highest end cameras. So everything's at 1080p 24, except for the iPhone or iPad. Those output 1080p 5994, and you can't change it. So that has to be scaled, and that's where the decimator comes in. So it's an HDMI. Well, from the iPhone or iPad, it's a uh, lightning to HDMI converter. You can get that from Apple. And then HDMI into the decimator, which I can then convert to whatever I need, in this case 1080p 24. And then that has SDI out, as well as HDMI out, but in this case I'm using SDI out straight into the ATEM as another source. Yeah, and on, you know, on, on the lines of like, you know, really painful lessons we had to learn ourselves that hopefully we can save our audience from having to learn the hard way, you know, uh, we, we bought one of the um, A10 television studios, which was, um, it's like a six input HDMI and SDI, it's about a thousand bucks, and when this thing came out, we're like, oh my gosh, this is such a game changer, like right. this is so cheap, and it was such a headache for us to try to match all these things. So at the time, we were trying to use a GoPro up in the corner for a little like cool shot, then we had like three different types of cameras, and all of a sudden what looked really cheap at the beginning, and it's still a great value, but the problem was since we had like four cameras that weren't matched, we either had to buy a bunch of converters and mess with that, or we had to go out and buy new cameras, right. which wasn't so cheap anymore. And one thing that's really nice um, about the, the Epiphan Pearl 2 that we're using today 
is, um, and this may seem crazy, but it's like we just plug stuff in and it's like, oh, picture, image. Yeah, we didn't have to go in and mess with settings. We didn't have to mess with the output settings. We didn't have to mess with the input settings. And scalers are built in. And so, right. again, back to that aspect of like, can we eliminate four of the, those little boxes that, you know, yes, each of those boxes is maybe, you know, $200, $300, but still that adds complexity to the setup. It's one more thing. Um, you either need to power them or you have to put batteries on them. Is that correct? Are these ones the powered uh, No, they're ones? powered off the wall. Okay. Um, so you have to have a, an outlet for them. So, you know, um, that's one thing that uh, we really liked about the Epifan Pearl 2 is that it has built-in scalers on every input. So right. you have both HDMI and SDI inputs. So yep. before we get to the Epifan Pearl 2 demo, let's finish up on your diagram sure. and talk about, so you have your mix signal coming out of your ATEM and how are you actually streaming it? Okay, well actually let's go to the left first because okay. before we get that, just very quickly we'll show yep. the preview. So the ATEM in my situation is up on my roof. I, I, my studio is a room within a room, so it's up on the roof of my studio, my broadcast studio. All the cables run up to there. So I need to be able to see what my audience sees as well as what all my other sources are to make sure that they're actually being seen by the ATEM. And that's what that little reference monitor is. It's a dual screen display. It's quite small. It sits right in front of me. It's just out of camera view, so the audience can't see it. But I can see all my sources. And then tethered to that is the HyperDeck shuttle recorder, which is now recording my show that I'm doing live because I always want to record a local backup just in case live goes bad, at least I have a local backup that I can scrap the live show and upload a video later to YouTube mm -hmm. or wherever I'm going to upload it. So that's on there. Down in the lower left corner, we see this thing that says StratiPro ATEM remote on an iPad. So this is a third-party app called StratiPro that's running on an iPad. And it's, it's running on, I think, a first or second gen iPad that I have. It's really old, soft, uh, really old hardware. But that is a Wi-Fi connection, of course, to the ATEM, and that's where I do all my switching. All of my switching is done from the iPad, so I have a touch interface. The, if I was doing it on the, uh, in the computer interface, I would have to move a mouse and click. It's more actions as opposed to just reaching out and touching to make it go live, to make that channel and make that source go live. So I do all of that through, through there. And everything is controlled through macros, which is a whole other conversation, but everything is macroed all in that touch interface. We talked briefly about the audio. Uh, all my audio sources are going into the Xair. I don't have everything mapped out on here, but if you scroll down, you can see there's a couple of mics on there and then a monitor, so I'm self-monitoring. I'm hearing myself as well as everything else that's going on. So if I hit play on my, let's say I want to play a video off my laptop, if I hit play and I don't hear it, then I know my audience can't hear it. I'm hearing what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. If my mic goes bad, I'll hear that because it's in my ear. So this is really important to me to be able to self-monitor. This is great, and this is something I would love to add here because uh, you know I, I came from the radio world, and the radio world, that, that's very common. You're always monitoring yourself. Yeah. And, and when you have uh, talent on camera who's not really used to doing broadcasting, like if you're doing an interview with someone, you don't want them to hear themselves a lot of times. It freaks them out. But, <laughs> but if for someone like yourself or someone like myself, I would feel actually a lot more confident because right. we sometimes also have had to do some goofy things. Like, for example, um, because we don't have a monitoring system, if we do roll a video in the middle, I, I, I can't really hear it. Sometimes I don't even see it. Oh, and so yeah. I have to rely on, on our, our, someone who's producing the show right. to sort of give me a cue like, oh, hey, the video's almost done. And, you know, self-monitoring actually is a really interesting thing that I would love to add to our setup. And it's the type of thing, it's not necessary. Um, it adds a little more complexity, but um, would be very nice. So. One of the other advantages of having your ears in is that you can have your producer who's behind the scenes talking to you, but the audience can't hear them. Mm -hmm. So I have that setup. We have, it's called a talkback mic, and it's just a simple little cheap gooseneck mic that we've rigged up. And my assistant can grab that, and he hits the talk button, and he can say something to me. He can tell me if anything, you know, oh, you missed a, a really good comment up there, or the bandwidth has dropped through the floor, or we're not live anymore, or whatever. I know what's going on. He can tell me what's happening. Yeah, I mean, one thing that, you know, we see is that basically everyone, even if you're a total novice to video production, everyone has an, an image in their mind of what a video production should be. And I would say the simplest way to put it is, if you live in the U.S. at least, it's ESPN or CNN. Everyone wants to make a show that essentially right. looks like those. You know, yeah. like they, and they think all of that should be super easy. So <laughs> what is that? It's like yeah. you, know, you have four people on camera. You're bringing in remote guests from different cities. You have some graphical feed on the left that shows yeah. you all your topics that you're talking about. You're bringing tweets in. You're rolling video clips. You know, and all of that is remarkably difficult to do because you know you, you end up having like 50 different sources. And so, you know, that's one thing that people will kind of discover the hard way is that, you know, again, a lot of times you, you, you start out, you think, well, I just have like one camera and maybe a, a screen capture and that's okay, I just need to switch between them. But then as soon as you have something like a Skype guest, you need something where you basically have two pictures and then overlaid over a background. And so that's where you start to have to really think a little bit more about your setup. Yeah. 
And we'll show you that type of shot that we have. We've probably already seen it today. I can't see it because we're not monitoring ourselves here. But um, we'll show you. We set up that kind of shot on the Epifan, which is pretty cool. You can do it with something like the, the uh, black magic switcher you're using. Right. And all these types of things are really important to get that, that kind of production yeah, value. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now we can finally go to the right. We can talk about the actual streaming. So the black magic box is, is the switcher. Right, everything goes into that, it does all the switching, and then it outputs what's called the program out, and it outputs that over multiple SDI and an HDMI connection. So I can send that program out to multiple locations. Um, in fact, one of them loops back into the Skype system so that I can show my Skype guest that I'm talking to my screens if I want mm -hmm. to as well. But one of those has to go out to the encoder. And now we talked about earlier, well, what, what are you using for your encoder? Encoder has to exist somewhere in here. And that HDMI cable could go out and plug directly into the... Um, the, the video if I wanted to, but that doesn't give me quite as much control and options. So what we have is that SDI cable comes out, it goes into a mini converter, and this is another Blackmagic product, so it's a mini converter SDI to Thunderbolt, and then that Thunderbolt is plugged into a 5K iMac. And that 5K iMac is running Wirecast. And Wirecast is doing the encoding and streaming. That's what's sending the image to YouTube, or if I was doing Facebook, or whatever, or any RTMP stream, that's where it's going to send it out to. The only other thing Wirecast does is an end of show graphic that Ryan will, will activate. When I say thank you very much, goodbye, I say goodbye, he hits roll on that, it rolls that over, and then I'm off the air, but we're still streaming this graphic, and that's coming from Wirecast. And that's the only other thing it does. But it handles that encoding and streaming, and that's a totally separate system, so you get another piece of hardware that has to be in there, which, incidentally, you don't have to have if you've got the Pearl, because it's all built in. Totally. It's, I, I got, and again, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'm not saying this because they're there. I've, I've used the Pearl for a while. I did a review on it maybe six months ago or so. It's on my YouTube channel. If people want to check it out, please go check it out there. But it's when I first got it, it's an $8,000 box. And you think, oh my God, $8,000, are you kidding me? But then once you realize what it does, how many pieces of this puzzle it replaces, it's not only a fair price, it's a good price. You can spend more than that building a system separately. Um, it's a, it's a good product to look at if you're getting serious about live streaming. It's a lot of money to spend right away, but you're probably going to get there eventually. So, Yeah, and, and I think a lot of times, you know, people, people underestimate, um, you know, a lot of people ask us, hey, can I do everything on a laptop? And it's like, yeah, you can, you can definitely do a stream on a laptop, but, um, you know, you reach a point where you, your laptop starts to look like a crazy octopus because <laughs> it has, you know, so many dongles coming out of it. And, you know, you really... Eventually, again, what you thought was a simple setup turns out to not be simple yeah. because you, as you want to add these pieces, you have to, you know, you end up having to add a lot, of, a lot of different things. And so, whether that's adding another computer to play back a video to run into your first computer, or whether that's adding all these converters and scalers in between, or you know, whatever those pieces are. So um, it's one thing. So we're going to talk a little bit. This is the Pearl 2. We have one right here. So it's a, it's a nice uh, compact box. It really is. You know, yeah. it's, it's not quite as small as the Teradek, so we're not going to put this on top of your GH5. <laughs> um, however, you know, this is, um, there's a lot going on in, in a really small package here. So we have, um, hopefully we can kind of see this, we have uh, SDI inputs, we have HDMI inputs, we have XLR inputs on here, which I really like. Some of the people that have built these similar encoders, they never put those analog XLR uh, inputs on them, which right. is really useful. And this is something that um, you could put it in a rack and you can run it 24-7. Um, or you could put it in a carrying case and bring yeah, it with absolutely. you on the road. So This thing even has USB inputs. You could take a, a cheap webcam and plug it in and get another source, and it's going to automatically scale and sync up with the rest of your content. Yeah, so this is... Um, uh, and one thing, too, that you know, I, I was a learning lesson for me was originally I was a little bit intimidated about sort of network gear, and I know a lot of people, that, that doesn't seem so comfortable to them. So, so a lot of times people like the idea of, well, I have... Either it's some people are really old school hardware and they think they couldn't possibly switch unless they had a giant T-bar. Right. Other people are like, you know, well, I have to have a keyboard and mouse right on the thing. Um, but, you know, one thing I really like about network gear, which is what you have in your setup as well, yeah. is that is that you can uh, maybe use an iPad to control it, or you can have, you don't need to worry about where it's physically located. So right. this one is just a prop. Believe it or not, we're not streaming from this one today, so I don't <laughs> want anyone to put what? up those videos being like, he lied, look, there's no cables connected. <laughs> um, so uh, this is, a, this is a, a second one that we have. I, I believe it works, but uh, I, I don't know, because we haven't actually plugged it in. But we have an identical unit that's in the other room, but what's cool is I can access it, and I can. Uh, we're going to do in just a minute. I can show you all the controls, and I don't need to be anywhere near the physical unit. I could be right. halfway across the planet. And know? this is exactly how my setup is. My ATEM is a network unit. I, it's on the roof. I I never touch the physical buttons that are on it unless I'm troubleshooting something, and I'm up there moving cables, changing. Otherwise, I never touch it. 
the audio mixer, the Behringer A16 Air, uh, AR, AR, AR6, XAR16, there's a 16 in the name somewhere, that also, it does not have any physical buttons or knobs on it except for one knob to control your monitoring audio level. That's it. Everything else is controlled through software. So I have, you saw earlier on the Mac, I've got my ATEM control, my XAR control. I go full screen on those apps and I can just four fingers swipe between to go, oh, I need to control the mixer, I need to control the audio interface. If I was using the Pearl, I switch over to the Pearl, whatever it would be, and that's all there in this virtual software interface that somebody else can simultaneously get to as a backup, which is huge, 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 huge. Very cool. So let's, before we go into our demo of the Epifan Pearl 2 and we look at our setup here, let's, yeah. let's um, we'll take a couple of questions. Um, so, uh, Someone said, can you elaborate on wireless st sticks that are available commercially and reliable? So, you, I, know, you know, I don't know what brand you're using there. Yeah, this, it's nothing special. What is this? This is uh, Alcatel. Um, it's actually a really funny story of how I acquired this. I was at NAB and just realized that I really needed one of these. And someone goes, well, I didn't have time to order it on Amazon and get it the same day. Um, he goes, well, I'll just sell you mine. I have two of them. So I just bought this from somebody else. But all I did was pop my T-Mobile SIM into here, plug this in, and the way it's set up is as soon as you plug it in, it gets its power from the laptop, the whatever you're plugging it into, and it connects to the internet and it goes live. That's it. Just plug it in and hands off and it goes. So super, super handy. But it is a single point of failure and it's limited to your 4G bandwidth. And if, if you're in a if you're in a good area, we've got really good LTE and not a lot of interference, it can be great. And I've done shows where I stream for an hour solid, no problems at all from this. But you get into some environments and it just isn't there. It isn't quite good enough. But I don't know that buying other brands of these are going to make them any better. I couldn't say to that. But what you can do is get multiple of these. And then depending on the system you're using, some systems will let you bond them together or use them as fail-safe backups, which can be really handy as well. Yeah, so perfect segue actually into another question we have. Someone said, what about LiveView? Do you like it? And we've used them quite extensively. And what LiveView is, for those of you who aren't familiar, is what's called a cellular bonding uh, type of system. And so the way it works is that you have a, a box, and we've been working with LiveView for many years. The first boxes were about the same size as this, and you wore it on your back. And I'll tell you, it got pretty heavy after wow, a while. Yeah. Um, and they've been getting sort of progressively smaller, so they, now they're down this big. And um, the way it works is that you have multiple cellular connections inside of, um, inside of a single unit, and they bond together so you can basically use the power of four of your cell phones, essentially. Right. And, um, and another strategy that they typically employ is they, they usually will combine different carriers. So, you know, maybe in some places, for, for those of us in the U.S., in some places Verizon's good, some places maybe it's T-Mobile, maybe it's AT&T. Sure. And so um, it, it's pretty reliable and also... Uh, you mentioned NAB. NAB is one of the largest trade shows in the country. It's where all of us video geeks go every year. And um, we've walked around NAB and CES, which is an even bigger show, the Consumer Electronics Show, with one of these live view packs. And even in that kind of saturated environment, maintain oh, wow. a signal most of the time. That's great. Um, and yeah. so, you know, what I would say with, with them is that they're really popular in news gathering. When, when you need to you got to get a signal out of some place and you got to be portable. It's a great choice. We've also seen a lot of people use them as, as backups. They say, hey, what if I'm at the venue and the network totally fails? Can I just plug into this thing? Yeah, you could use that. Yeah. And uh, it's, it saved us a couple times. So um, it can be a great choice. And you can do you know, uh, pretty high bit rates now with, with cellular bonding. Yeah, so. absolutely. Cool. Um, okay. Um, so a couple other questions. Are there any advantages to SDI or, or HDMI? I, mean, I think we covered that pretty well. It's yeah. a, a big part of it is the cable run. The cables are less expensive when you get really long. And the SDI cables are actually thinner. If you have a really long HDMI cable, I've got a couple of 40-footers. They're big honking cables, and they're hard to wrap around things, and they're heavy. They're more cumbersome to work with. SDI is much thinner. It's easier to work with and uh, cheaper. And, and SDI on every single um, thing it locks. Oh, whereas, yes, that's Whereas, huge, you know, huge. On, this has a really cool locking thing to, to make it lock on right. the GH5, but uh, typical HDMI connection does not lock. Right, it so. goes in, you, it, there's a little springy point, it pushes past, you turn it, and then it pops itself back out to lock in, and those cannot fall out. That's, yeah, they're awesome. Um, someone said, would the tabletop mic be a condenser mic? Yes, I believe that would be a condenser mic. Pretty sure the PR40 is. Uh, I don't remember. Exactly. I'm not a big mic guy, but there are condenser and non-condenser. Yeah, or generally, yeah. Uh, generally, most uh, the, the the basic concept between dynamic and condenser mics is dynamic, dynamic mics don't require power, and dynamic mics are great if you want to scream into them or really be uh, really loud in them. Most condenser the mic, most yeah, I don't know on that one specifically, but most condenser mics require power, 
and condenser mics usually are better at picking up softer type of sounds. So, okay. um, so uh, like these are condenser mics, most of your boom mics are condenser mics, but... Um, well, the PR40, whatever it is, it sounds incredible. It really is. I love using that mic because it just sounds so good. Um, so, uh, someone else said, uh, what, what kind of internet connection do I need? And I think the answer to that is basically the best one you can possibly <laughs> afford. Um, but, you know, it's, it's uh, luckily, cons even consumer-grade internet connections are getting better and better. Um, but what you really want to be cautious about is making sure that you have a lot of headroom yeah. and trying to make sure that your connection is relatively dedicated so you're not sharing it with a lot of other people. Yeah, if you're, whatever you've got coming into your house or studio, whatever it is, obviously it's the upload stream that speed that you need to worry about. Uh, that's what matters for your streaming because you're sending up. And unfortunately, most consumer internet is, while it might be really good down, you might get 40 megabit down, you get 2 megabit up, and that's not enough. And you need to look at what your bandwidth is of, of what you're trying to output. If you're doing a 1080p stream, you probably want a good 6 megabit output. You can do 4, you can do a 4 megabit stream, but the quality is a little bit lower. If you want better quality, you've got to go to 6. And if you want UHD, want all the way up to 4K, then you're talking about 12 to 16 megabits up. And that's just what the stream requires. And as you said, you need headroom. You need at least 50% more than that so that you have room for fluctuations, other network traffic, and so on. And then go wired. We talked about wireless earlier. Go wired, don't go wireless, and make sure that nothing else is happening on your network. Every time we go live, we make sure everybody in the studio has their backups shut off. We all use Backblaze, everything's always backing up. We have so much data, it's pretty much uploading nonstop 24 seven, but everybody has to shut off their Backblaze before I go live, because otherwise it could interrupt the stream and that's not okay. Yeah. All right, so let's, um, uh, we're gonna transition here and let's, uh, Let's talk about the Epifan Pearl 2. So um, here's, uh, here's a shot of it. Um, that's not us on the screen there. Um, <laughs> we also showed it to you physically here in the studio. And what I'll do is I'm going to um, show you um, actually what the interface looks like. So, um, so we'll go here. And um, one of the really cool things, let me see if I can uh, revive my session here. So we talked earlier about some of the advantages of, of network gear. And so right now, um, just off screen, you can't see it. We have a little control room in our studio. And Mike Maldonado, who's our video production person, has is, is been switching the show, switching between different shots. And so what I'll do is I'm going to actually take over the session from him. And now you can see the same interface that he was using to switch um, on the screen here. And I'm going to do it just quickly because if I switch away, then we won't be able to see the screen anymore. <laughs> um, but what we'll do is we can load up our picture-in-picture -picture shot here. And I'll switch to that. And now you'll see uh, that, that we have basically a split screen of a graphic behind uh, with us in the wide shot and then um, the computer screen. So right. I'll switch back to the computer screen so we hopefully don't get uh, too meta here. And... Um, what's really cool with this Epifan is that, you know, we can, we can do all this remotely. So again, we can be here. We could even load this up on an iPad or something like that. And what we've done is in advance of the show, we've created all our shots. So we have a wide shot, which is one Panasonic Lumix GH5. We have two close-ups, uh, one of Joseph, one of Alden here. Those are uh, two additional Panasonic Lumix GH5s. And we have our computer screen, which is um, I have on the table here a MacBook Pro. This is going out, uh, HDMI cable out, and uh, that connects directly into our Epifan. Also, we have a little audio meter here. And so what we'll do here is we'll go back to, uh, let me go back to uh, the Epifan control, and we'll take a look at what the administration interface looks like. So uh, the way the Epifan Pearl 2 works is that you actually have two encoders in one. So uh, you know, we're talking about, yes, it's a pretty good value because it's replacing all that, but it's even better value because it's like you have two of your iMacs down in the lower right-hand right corner. So um, why would you need two channels? Well, maybe because um, you want to rack this somewhere, and maybe you have two different studios, and you want to be able to uh, do two live shows from two different studios, or you have two different conference rooms, and you want to be able to stream from two different conference rooms at the same time. You actually have two fully independent channels, and you can stream those out to different locations. Or maybe you have one source and you say, well, I want to do my show to YouTube, but I also want to stream it at the same time to my mobile app, which is done through IBM Cloud Video, sure. and you could do those at the same time. Um, the other thing that's really neat is that we have all these different sources. So we have, you see on the left-hand side here, we have uh, HDMI A and B, HDMI 4K A and B, two SDI inputs, two USB inputs, as well as we have our XLR analog audio. 
So you can go onto any source. Um, here, we talked about it earlier. So here's our audio coming in. Uh, we've delayed the audio to get our uh, hopefully perfect lip synchronization. You know, there you go. We, we tried the best we could to get it correct. Um, we can look at our different input sources here. Um, one of the things that's also uh, great is that you can set up basically a failover. So we've set up a failover so if we lose signal on any of our cameras, we get this IBM Cloud video image here. That's awesome. So you don't just get an ugly black screen, you basically get this failover if you don't have something connected to one of them. So what we'll do here is we're only using one channel today and we'll, we'll go take a look at this channel that we've set up. And uh, if I hit any wrong buttons, that's probably, you know, we, we lost the kill stream. The show, so let's you know, not. <laughs> so we'll try not to do that. Um, but at least you'll know why it happened. You can blame it on me. Um, so here's our different shots that we've set up. And on each shot, you can basically edit them. So we'll look at the picture-in-picture -picture one because that's probably the most complex one that we have going on. And we have different layers here. So basically, we've, we've composed this shot of background.jpg, uh, which is this purple thing with our logo. And then HDMI B, HDMI 4K B, those are the two HDMI inputs that we're using. And that's how we get that picture in picture. Um, down in the lower left-hand corner is one of the other really cool features about uh, this Epifan Pearl 2, which is the internal storage. Mm -hmm. So it has a 500 gigabyte drive built in, at least on this particular model. And what it does is it records whatever you're, you're streaming. But what's cool about it is that um, if you, let's say you only need this as a backup, or let's say you're streaming 24-7, um, you can set it so that it does has various modes. So you can offload the storage to a network drive. You can set it so when you plug in a USB, it'll automatically copy right. over and then delete whatever you didn't use. Or you can say, you know what, I, I don't think I'm ever going to need it, but I just want to save some backups, and you can just let it fill up, and then it'll start overwriting the old, oldest shows that you have. Yeah, it's super cool. So um, there's a lot more features to it, and, and we've been really kind of nerding out on this thing because, you know, it's, it has all these different kind of modes and a lot of flexibility in how you can configure it. So we're not going to go super deep on it today, but we'll probably, hopefully, if uh, Epifan will loan us some units, we'll do some deeper dives in future presentations. Um, and... The other, a couple other things that we really like about it that are cool is that it has different ways you can get signals in and out. So it's not just taking an SDI or taking an HDMI and streaming out RTMP, which is what you would need to stream to our platform or to YouTube, for example. But um, you can also send out like a local multi multicast stream on your network. You can pull in network feeds. And so we're really looking forward to using this for a lot of different applications where we might need sort of that Swiss Army knife aspect mm. of being able to route different things different places and being able to, you know, do something that's not just... Um, you know, taking in a really simple feed and streaming it, but do something a little bit more complicated than sure. that. And that's another thing I'd say that, you know, we found has been sort of a learning lesson for us with gear is that sometimes, you know, it's a tough balance. You don't want to buy way more than what you need, or you don't want to buy stuff that you don't need at all and buy the wrong thing. But on the other hand, if you... It, there's sometimes features that you're like, I don't know if I'd ever use that or ever need it. Or like, you know, this is always the case with inputs. You're like, I'm never going to use eight inputs. <laughs> right. And then like, you know, as soon as you get it, you've maxed that out. Right. And so, you know, what I like about this is like, let's say you say, well, I don't have any SDI stuff. I'm all HDMI right now. I don't need to pay for two SDI inputs. Well, what I like is when you buy a piece of gear that has more flexibility than what you think you need, it does more stuff than what you're using right now you can grow into it. Whereas yeah. if you buy something that's like a little less than what you need, you'll grow out of it very quickly yeah, and you'll have to true. buy more and more gear eventually. So. That's one thing that I, I feel I did the right thing when I did buy all the hardware that I did was everything was 4K capable. The cameras are 4K, the switcher's 4K. The only thing that I can't do 4K right now is the that final tap going into the computer to stream through Wirecast. And that's, I'm now wanting to go 4K, and so that is an option to do that. I'm not actually sure how well Wirecast will handle it, and also whether the iMac is going to be powerful enough, because that is a lot more data than the HD stream that I'm doing today. But that's that next step. I do want to go 4K, and everything else in the system is ready for it. I mean, I don't want you to you know, take my word on it, but I would say that you know, we've had pretty good results doing uh, 4K with Wirecast. It's a pretty new computer. Um, one tip, though, that's really important is you don't want to be doing a local recording of Wirecast at a different resolution than your oh, same right. stream because it'll basically do two encodes. Two encodes, yeah. Um, the other thing, too, that it's sort of, you know, one of those small things that's nice about having dedicated gear such as, you know, this Epifan Pearl 2 or if you are running Wirecast, 
don't try to use that computer for a million more things right. than, than just running Wirecast because, right. you know, installing a lot of other programs or running other programs in the background can definitely compete with it. So you want to really try to have purpose built. You yeah. know, you don't have to, not at all your stuff has to be dedicated hardware, uh, but if you are going to use, you know, a, a Mac or a Windows computer, you want to really try to be cautious about not doing a lot of their stuff on that same computer because yeah. that's a big appeal for a lot of people why they're like, oh, this is great, I can just use this thing I have sitting around. But if you start installing other programs or you're messing with the settings too much, it can cause some problems. So For sure. All right, so um, let's uh, take a few more questions here. Um, and I'll just uh, go back quickly to our presentation. And um, just as a reminder, please use that Q&A module if you have more questions. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, Adobe Flash Media Live Encoder, what's your opinion on it? Have you used it? No. So we Flash isn't Flash dead? Uh, so, we've used, well, so Adobe Flash Media Live Encoder was basically the original RTMP encoder. Okay. Um, it, they haven't updated it forever. Okay. It either doesn't work at all or it works great. Um, <laughs> and because they don't update it all, they don't break it. Um, but we've seen very mixed results with it. Okay. So literally it's either either you have it in a configuration and it's very it's been very popular for many years because you can run it in a command line mode too, which makes it very flexible. So um, if you have it working and you know one of the things that, that we've found is that there's kind of two types of people. There's people that like to get really nerdy and build their own computers and they like to like you know, install their own capture cards. And if you're someone who really likes to get kind of low level and you want to have really maximum control and you don't want to buy something from someone else, then Flash Media Live Encoder running command line with your own self-built PC and your own capture cards installed can be a great, super stable setup. Um, we work with a lot, of, um, a lot of production vendors and that's exactly the setup that they use. Okay. Um, but, you know, there's, if you don't want to be in control of your own destiny, aka if you don't want to be blamed when it breaks and you don't have time to fix it when it breaks, you might want to consider buying someone else's built box like this, where, you know, then you have a phone number and some kind of warranty right. and, you know, a little bit of an uh, insurance plan that, you know, um, you, can, you can know that your gear is going to work. So, um, so, you know, Flash yeah. Media Live Encoder works great. Um, if you can get it working, if you can't get it working, then you know I would consider using something else at this point because it's they, they haven't made any updates to the software in a really long time. Um, as opposed to say Wirecast, um, great software, they're updating it all the time. Um, you know Epifan, who's sponsoring us today, you know this is something that's being updated and maintained and supported. Right. So, um, okay, uh, someone else said um, specifics for a high quality outdoor webcam. Um, do you have any well, you have webcam? Any? Yeah. I mean, are you saying webcam is in a webcam like you'd put on top of your you know, little uh, little Logitech thing for a hundred bucks? Or I, you know, I don't know. I don't have the I don't have the uh, scenario here. Yeah. But let's assume they you know are limited to USB and want to put something outdoors. We have a number of people like to do bird cams and things like that. Okay. Okay. I, honestly, the the one webcam that I have always recommended. I don't I don't remember the model number off the top of my head, but it's a Logitech. It does 1080p. Logitech C920. There you go. That's the Every one. Every time someone it's, says, what yeah. camera should I buy? I say, well, you know what? If you just want me to tell you one camera, buy the Logitech C920. If you don't have any camera yet, buy that first. You know, do it, it'll be a big improvement over your built-in camera. Yeah. And then, you know, you'll learn eventually what you don't get with it. Right. You know, eventually you'll want to have more control over, you know, your, your being able to zoom and pan a camera. Eventually you'll want to upgrade to a real switcher, but Logitechs right. are great. They are. It is great. It, it's it's a nice little product because it has a built-in articulating arm and a little tripod socket on it, so you can either just put it over your screen like a regular webcam or put it on a tripod. It is 1080p. It's not the greatest 1080p in the world, but it is 1080p. And when you plug it into your computer, and I don't know about on a PC, but on a Mac, you have this uh, app called Webcam Settings, and you can go into it and change. You can go do manual exposure, manual white balance, even manual focus, and that can be quite handy as well. Great. Um, so I think that's all we'll do for the questions today, but I appreciate everyone's questions. And a bunch of people asked if we can get a copy of the presentation and we'll make those available. Great. So assuming you registered, uh, we'll mail those out afterwards. I want to thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. And, uh, before we wrap up, we have a few plugs here. So um, our website, IBM Cloud Video, we were formerly Ustream.tv, so that's still where you can find us. You can find Panasonic, panasonic.com slash Lumix, epifan.com, 
And you're on YouTube. I'm on YouTube, youtube.com slash photojoseph. And that's Photo Joseph everywhere. YouTube, obviously, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Just type in Photo Joseph, you'll find me. It's everywhere. Great. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. And was thank fun. you for joining us. And uh, please watch our next webinar. We'll have future presentations where you can learn more tips and tricks for live streaming.